Good evening, everyone. Good to see you. Appreciate you coming out tonight. Would you be surprised if I tell you that there will not be one rich man in heaven? And at the same time, I would add, there will be no poor man in heaven. You see, the idea of rich and poor, the idea of wealth and poverty, are measurements of man. They are measurements of, of this material world, and, and we use them as class distinctions. We look at someone driving a nice automobile, and we say, wow, he must be rich. I can remember years ago asking Dad when I was a teenager about some neighbors who had very nominal jobs, but they always drove nice cars, and, and he made the comment. He said, well, they're probably in debt. And sometimes that's the truth as well. But, but we see people wearing nice clothes, driving nice cars, and doing things, and, and we associate that with wealth. And, and we see someone driving a run-down, beat-up vehicle or wearing older, worn-out clothes, and we think, poor. And thus we make many of the class distinctions in society based upon what we perceive as, as wealth and poverty. And certainly we live in an age, we live in a society where this idea of trust in material things is emphasized. Just look at most of the commercials. It's about things. It's about objects, about getting, about obtaining. It's all about money and wealth. And certainly the Bible makes it clear that those who are going to enter into that heavenly home are not going to be there because they are wealthy. And certainly they're not going to be there just because they were poor or didn't have certain possessions. Those who were saved in the last day are going to be there because of God's grace and mercy. They're going to be saved because of the sacrifice that Jesus made in our behalf. It has nothing whatsoever to do with our financial status with how much money we have in the bank or how much we make each year. And of course the problem that Christians face, and I suppose this has always been the case, how do we not succumb, how do we not fall victim to the idea of accumulating wealth, that somehow having more and bigger and better and newer makes us a better person or makes us perhaps more acceptable in the sight of God. And there is that constant tug of the world, isn't it? We want to, as the old saying is, keep up with the Joneses. We want to be like our neighbors. We want to be like our friends. And so we need to realize that money is not the answer to our problems. You know, today in politics, it's interesting. Anytime there's a problem and they'll be interviewing a politician, well, what are we going to do about the school issue? Or what are we going to do about this issue? Or whatever it is, well, we need more money. As though money is the answer to every problem that society faces. And as individuals, we sometimes have that. How many times have you heard someone say, or how many times have you perhaps yourself said, if I only had more money, if I only had more money, I could do this. I would be able to do that. And so again, the question, how do we not succumb to this idea of materialism, of money being the answer to all things. I want to suggest some things just very briefly this evening. I think, first of all, one of the first things we need to do is to count our blessings. And this is an area where I think we fall very short as Christians. We need to realize that God is the giver of all things. We must never forget that everything that we have, our jobs, our homes, our automobiles, the very clothes we wear, the food we eat, and the money that we may have in the bank, all of these things come from God. Even back in Ecclesiastes chapter 5 and verse 19, we find these words, Every man also to whom God hath given riches and wealth. Notice, God hath given riches and wealth and hath given him power to eat thereof, and to take his portion, and to rejoice in his labors. This is the gift of God. Again, another passage from the book of James, chapter 1 and verse 17, one I'm sure you remember. James says that every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Now, the Bible doesn't condemn riches, contrary to what some people think. Some have the idea that rich necessitates bad, that rich people are evil people and God favors poor. No, some of the best people in the world are wealthy. Some of the sorriest people in the world are wealthy. And likewise, some of the best people in the world are, are poor. And some of the sorriest people in the world are poor. The bottom line is, you got good and bad people in every category, financially, educationally, socially, and otherwise. And so we can't look and say, well, he's got money, he must be dishonest. Or he's poor, he must be lazy. These are mischaracterizations that we must not make. 
And the Bible does tell us that we can be wealthy and be pleasing to God. And we're going to see some of those examples uh, in just a few minutes. But secondly, we need to give God the glory for whatever we have. As I said a moment ago, every gift, every blessing we enjoy comes from our Heavenly Father. And we must never forget that what we have comes from God because everything is God's to begin with. How many times do you hear people say, well, I did this. I started this business and built it from the ground up. Or some other accomplishment they did. No, everything that we have, everything that we do, we have from God because it all was God's. As the psalmist said, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. Psalm 24 and verse 1. Again, Psalm 50, verse 10 and 11, a verse that I've heard all of my life. For every beast of the forest is mine, and the cattle upon a thousand hills. I know all the birds of the mountains, and the wild beast of the field are mine. It was all God's. And He has entrusted us with a certain amount of His things in this earth. But when we die, they're left behind. We're not going to take anything with us. And so we must recognize that it's from God's. And in connection with this, you know, we live in a generation where thank you is almost a shock. Many people, you open the door for somebody and they just look at you. Or someone drops something and you pick it up, they just take it and go on. Maybe I'm just, well, I know I'm getting old, but, but I can remember when I was young, you know, you were taught if someone opens the door, you say thank you. If someone helps you with something, thank you. You express gratitude. And it's bad enough to be ungrateful to one another, but when we fail to give thanks to God, when we fail to recognize that He is the one who's given us all these things, 1 Thessalonians 5.18, In all things, giving thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. And then Paul to the Ephesians in that letter, chapter 5 and verse 18, actually verse 20 is what I want to skip down to, he says, Giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Do we give thanks to God? Now, we're quick to go to God when we need something. You know, I, I need that raise at work. I need a pay increase. And we pray about it. God, help me to get that raise. Or, or God, help me to be able to, to do this financially. But then when we get what we have prayed for, do we go to God in thanks and express gratitude for whatever that blessing or, or blessings may be? But something else to help keep us on track financially, we need to give God our best. We don't want to give God the leftovers, and I think sometimes that's what we do. And let's never forget, we reap in proportion to what we sow, to what we give. Now, I know we, we reap what we sow, but as far as financially, we're going to reap in proportion to what we sow or to what we give. Listen to 2 Corinthians 9, 6 and 7. But this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly. And we, he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Every man, according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. And then if you drop down and begin reading in verse 9, he says, As it is written, he hath dispersed abroad, he hath given to the poor, his righteousness remaineth forever. Now he that ministereth seed to the sower, both minister bread for your food, and multiply your seed sown, and increase the fruits of your righteousness, being enriched in everything to all bountifulness, which causes through us thanksgiving to God. You know, today farmers go to the co-op and buy their seed, but many of you remember years ago when the farmers would save the seed for the next year's crop. They didn't eat it all, they didn't sell it all. And those farmers wouldn't wait till the grain bin was down almost to the floor and, and everything had either been eaten or sold or consumed by the livestock. And the, the farmers, in the very beginning, they would pick out the best seed for sowing, for planting next year, because they know that by sowing the good seed, they're going to reap a better harvest. And yet, many people want to give God the culls, the scraps, the leftovers, and then wonder why the harvest is not what we expect it to be. You know, if you look back at Proverbs chapter 3, verse 9 and 10, Solomon talks about giving God the first fruits. He says, Honor the Lord with thy substance and with the first fruits of all thine increase. So shall, in other words, here's the consequence of honoring God with the first fruits, so shall thy barns be filled with plenty and thy presses shall burst out with new wine. Now, how many times do we give God at the end of the week, actually the first day of the week, rolls around and, and we look in our wallet and we see what we've got left and we drop it in the plate. 
We haven't purposed, we haven't planned, we have not sacrificed to give to God. We've paid the bills, we've done what we wanted to do, and, and then if there's something left, we drop it in the plate. That's not what the scriptures talk about here. But thirdly, we need to seek God's wisdom in using the blessings that he's given to us. You know, with the blessings that God has given us comes a responsibility. Back in Genesis, God was talking about how he was going to bless Abraham, what he was going to do for Abraham, and he said, but be thou a blessing. And Abraham was indeed a blessing to others. He realized the responsibility that came with what he had. Uh, we should not hoard our possessions, refusing to help those who are in need. And yet sometimes that's what happens. If you look in Matthew 19 at the man there, the rich young ruler, we call him. Here was a man who had been blessed, and we don't know how he got his money. He could have inherited it. He could have made investments. He could have just been a good businessman. But, but he had a full measure of the blessings of life. But when it came to stewardship, he had failed, didn't he? He didn't want to give. In fact, Jesus implies that his wealth had become his God. And instead of following Jesus, making the sacrifice and following Jesus, the text says that, that he went away sad. And of course the passage that was read from 1 Timothy 6 talks about the danger of, of laying up in store, or not laying up in store, uh, of the blessings that we enjoy. You know, God is not subject to the whims of the stock market. God blesses us in good times. He blesses us in bad times. Now, possibly sometimes we think, well, I'm not getting enough, or, or maybe I'm not getting what I need, but the fact is God knows our needs, and he does provide for them. And the investments that we make by giving back to God are going to reap far more than anything that we give to him. The blessings, the return are going to be far more than the investment we make. So, so again, what are we doing with God's blessings? I want to consider some examples in the scriptures of those who were blessed. And just mentioned Abraham a moment ago. Abraham was a tremendously rich man. On one occasion, he was able to form an army of men from his servants to go out and to rescue his nephew Lot and others who'd been taken captive by marauders there. But here was a man who was tremendously blessed, and yet I would suggest to you that Abraham never forgot God. Over and over we find God offer, excuse me, Abraham offering God sacrifices from place to place. And as we saw this morning, he was willing to leave his home and to go to this new place that God called him. And God continued to bless Abraham, because, at least in part because of his faithfulness. What about Job? Job's another outstanding character in the Old Testament. And, and as you read the opening chapter there, Job was a tremendously wealthy man. He had flocks, he had herds, he had servants. He was a man who was well respected, he was well known in the community. And yet, when tragedy struck, what did he do? Did he turn his back on God? Did he curse God? And that's what his wife said, remember? She said, why don't you curse God and die? Renounce God and die. And he said, no. His answer was profound. The Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Job faced the tragedies that he struck and it seems like just one right after another. He lost his flocks, he lost his herds, he lost his children, he lost his servants. He lost everything except his wife. And Satan used her as a stumbling block or at least tried to use her as a stumbling block. And Job, if he teaches us anything, he teaches that it is possible for the child of God to lose everything and to retain his faith. Now, granted, Job questioned why this was happening. He didn't understand. And he said, I'd like to talk to God. I'd like to ask him why this is happening. But, but he never cursed God. He never renounced God as some would have done. And so here was a wealthy man who did not lose his integrity. Even when his close friends and comrades came and they began to accuse him. Okay, Job, what have you done? Confess. You know God doesn't punish righteous people. You've done something really bad. And of course you recall the end of the story. God blessed Job even far greater than the blessings he had had prior to the tragedy in his life. What about Solomon? I suppose there was no other character ever blessed more than the young man Solomon. If you look at 2 Chronicles chapter 1, verses 11 and 12, and then I want to read verses 14 through 17. Notice, and God had appeared to Solomon and said, what, what do you want? What would you like? What do you want me to give you? And Solomon shows a great deal of wisdom and discretion in what he says. And here's what God says to him, because this was in thy heart, 
And thou hast not asked riches, wealth, or honor, nor the life of thine enemies, neither yet hast thou asked long life, but hast asked wisdom and knowledge for thyself that thou mayest judge my people over whom I have made thee king. Wisdom and knowledge is granted unto thee, and I will give thee riches and wealth and honor, such as none of the kings have had that have been before thee. Think about it, to have greater riches, greater wealth, and greater honor than any other king before thee. And then verse 14, And Solomon gathered chariots and horsemen, and he had a thousand and four hundred chariots, twelve thousand horsemen, which he placed in the chariot cities, and with the king at Jerusalem. And the king made silver and gold at Jerusalem as plentiful as stones. And cedar trees made he as the sycamore trees. And you've got to understand that uh, the cedar trees were very valuable. They were a very precious commodity that were shipped all over that area. But he made uh, the cedar trees, made he as sycamore trees that are in the vale for abundance. And Solomon had horses brought out of Egypt and linen yarn. The king's merchants received the linen yarn at a price. And they fetched up and brought forth out of Egypt a chariot for 600 shekels of silver and a horse for 150. And so brought they out horses for all the kings of the Hittites and for the kings of Syria by their means. You know, later when Solomon wrote the book of Ecclesiastes, he enumerated some of the things that he had had and he enjoyed there in chapter 2 and verse 4. He said, I made me great works, I builded me houses, I planted me vineyards, I made me gardens and orchards, and I planted trees in them with all kinds of fruits. And I made me pools of water to water therewith the wood that bringeth forth trees. And I got me servants and maidens, and I had servants born in my house. Also I had great possessions of great and small cattle above all that were in Jerusalem before me. I gathered me also silver and gold and the peculiar treasures of kings and of the provinces. I got me men singers and women singers and the delights of the son of men as musical instruments in them of all sorts so that I was great and increased more than all they that were before me in Jerusalem. Also my wisdom remained with me. And whatsoever mine eyes desired, and listen to this verse, this is verse 10, and whatsoever mine eyes desired, I kept not from them. I withheld not my heart from any joy, for my heart rejoiced in all my labor, and this was my portion of all my labor. Here was a man who had it all. Here was a man who had the money and the wealth and the power to have, to do whatever he wanted. And by the way, we're not dealing with uh, his life necessarily as a topic tonight, but I find it interesting if you keep reading, he finally surmises and says, Vanity of vanity, saith the preacher, all is vanity. He realized that these possessions meant nothing. And as he approached the end of his life, remember what he said, Fear God and keep his commandments for this is the whole duty of man. He went full circle, materialist to a spiritually minded man before he died. But you know, the poor can also magnify God as well as the wealthy. And I guess the first to come to mind is Mark chapter 12. We read about the poor widow who dropped in two mites and, and the fact that she gave less than a penny and yet she was commended by the Lord and he said she gave more than all the others. I find it significant the Lord never praised or recognized any other giver except this woman of Mark chapter 12. She gave her all, and she glorified God by that act, the lesson being that we can glorify God with very small amounts as well as with the large amounts. What about the Macedonians in 2 Corinthians 8? The, these brethren gave far beyond anything that Paul had expected them to give. And, and in spite of the fact that they had limited resources... They sacrificed and they gave willingly and joyful, joyfully to help others. Now, why were they able to do this? Paul tells us because they first gave their own selves unto the Lord. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 1 through 5. And what about the brethren at Smyrna? We talked about the church at Smyrna this morning there in Revelation chapter 2. If you look at verse 9, these people were poor, and yet God calls them rich. I guess that would be a paradox. He says, I know thy works and tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. They were in poverty, but they were rich. Is that a contradiction? No. They, they were in poverty, physically speaking. Monetarily, they didn't have a lot. But spiritually, they were rich. Spiritually, they were wealthy. And it wasn't their financial success that made them rich. It was their faith in Christ. And it was their faith in the face of tribulation that made them rich. Remember David's words in Psalm 37 and verse 16. He said, A little that a righteous man has is better than the riches of many wicked. 
And that's true. A little that the righteous man has is better than the riches of many. But before we close, I want to mention one other point, and that is we need to realize what money cannot buy. You know, in our society, you can buy almost anything with money. If you want to go up in space on a spaceship, there's a group, and I've just heard about it on the radio, don't remember the guy's name, but I believe it's $500,000 you can book a seat on a spaceship. Now, if you've got $500,000 you want to waste, see me. We can work something out. But there are people signed up to be shot up into space. If you've got the money, you can do it. Anything you want to buy, if you've got the money or arrange the financing, you can buy it. And yet, there's certain things that can't be bought. For example, a relationship with God. There's nothing that we can do or offer to make ourselves acceptable to God. We can't go to God and say, okay, I'm going to give a million dollars to the church. I'm going to build a hospital. I'm going to build a home for the aged or for children or, or whatever and expect to have a relationship with God. It is only through God's grace and obedience to his will that we can become a child of God and have that relationship. It's not something that can be bought. It's not something that's reserved for those who are financially able to do it. A good name is something else that can't be bought. A good name is what people think about when they hear our name. When we hear someone's name, what comes to mind? Liar, cheat, crook, lazy. Or when we hear someone's name, do we think honest, hardworking, good husband, good wife, good mother, hard worker, good Christian? That's what I'm talking about when I say we can't buy a good name. That's something that takes years to accomplish. In fact, Proverbs 22 and verse 1 says, A good name is rather to be chosen than great riches, and loving favor rather than silver and gold. You know, we all were given a name at birth. And over the years, we either polished that name and gave it good meaning to the people that know us. Or perhaps by our lives, we've drugged that name through the mud. And all the money in the world can't give us a good name. It's something that must be worked at. It must be something that we achieve over time. But again, money won't buy us satisfaction. Some people have the idea, if I just have a big enough car, I'll be happy. If I can afford a big enough home, I will be happy or whatever happens to be on their bucket list to possess. And yet, people find out when they get that new, bigger, pricier car, they're not happy. Because eventually they're going to see something a little newer, a little bigger, a little more classy, and, oh, i got to have that one. And so they want to trade and keep moving. Up. And it becomes a constant cycle, and, and we're never satisfied with, with what we have. Because there's always something a little better or a little newer. Remember Solomon speaks of those who had accumulated so much and yet they weren't happy? So I guess this has always been a problem. But Ecclesiastes 5.10, He that loveth silver shall not be satisfied with silver, nor he that loveth abundance with increase. This is all vanity. And so riches cannot bring satisfaction to us, brethren. But notice also that it can't buy comfort in time of sorrow. You know, you can give $1,000 to a grieving family who's lost a loved one to help cover the funeral expenses but it can't console their sorrow you can give ten thousand dollars and it's not going to take away the hurt that they feel of the death of a loved one i'm reminded of david back in second samuel chapter 12 verses 16 and 17 remember his child the child that he and bathsheba had conceived out of wedlock the child was very sick and possibly wasn't going to live they didn't know at that time but David besought God for the child, and David fasted and went in and lay on the earth upon the earth, excuse me, lay all night upon the earth. And the elders of his house arose and went to him and rose him up from the earth, but he would not. Neither did he eat bread with them. Here was a man who was in great sorrow, and he was praying, he was beseeching God to let that child live. And when that child died, David grieved as any father would. Perhaps this is why God is called the God of all comfort in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, 3 and 4 because he does comfort us in times of tribulation. But you see, money didn't help David. David was a wealthy man. He was the king. And yet he grieved for the loss of his child just like any father, rich or poor. And closely related to that, money will not buy the return of a loved one. <clears throat> you remember in Exodus 12, the last plague 
brought on Egypt was the death of the firstborn. And it not only affected the slave, the laborer, but it even affected Pharaoh's house. Pharaoh's son died. His magicians and astrologers could not bring his son back to life. His money could not restore him to health. He had to live with that loss even though he had all of that money. The fact is we can't control death. We can't control sorrow. And money is not going to help. It doesn't help at all when it comes to losing our loved one. And finally notice that money will not buy us a home in heaven. The only way, as we said this morning, to be in heaven is when we comply with and live according to God's rules. When we obey his gospel and live the way that he would have us to live. It doesn't matter how much money we give. That's not going to get us to heaven in and of itself. How many benevolent works we may do, that's not going to help us to be saved. It's not going to forgive our sins. Much like the foolish man in Luke chapter 12, here was a man who had blessed tremendously and, and he prospered and he said, I'm going to tear down my barns and I'm going to build bigger barns and I'm just going to take it easy. And In fact, his words were, I'm going to say to my soul, eat, drink, and be merry. But then God asked him a question there in verse 20. He says, Thou fool, this night is thy soul required of thee. And then here's the question that God asked him in the latter part of verse 20. Then who shall these things be which thou hast provided? You see, the rich man's wealth wasn't going to do him any good because he was going to die. He was going to leave everything behind and as the question remains, whose shall these things be? It matters not how much money we have in the bank or how much property we own because when we leave this life, it's going to be left behind. And the only thing that will matter when we stand before God in judgment is have we prepared have we obeyed his will? If not, we're going to hear him say, Depart from me, I never knew you. If we've obeyed and lived faithfully, we're going to hear him say, Well done, good and faithful servant. And we're going to hear that invitation to enter into that heavenly home. But you see, the choice is ours. But again, it's not based upon what we have in the bank or what we've accumulated, but what we've done with the time and the talents that we have been blessed with in this life. I hope you'll think about these things. As I said in the beginning, it's not wrong to have money or possessions as long as we use them and don't let them control us. As long as we use them for right things for the glory of God. And as God told Abraham, we must be a blessing to others. But we're going to bring our study to a close at this point. If you need to respond to the invitation of Christ tonight, either to become a child of God or to be restored as an erring Christian, you can do that. If you've never obeyed the gospel, come in faith, repenting of your sins, confessing his name, and being baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. Or if as a child of God you've wandered away and need to come back, ask for the prayers of the church and ask God's forgiveness. Will you come while together we stand and we sing?